Hello friends, on this glorious day in beverage history, we have officially settled into a groove. This is episode number five of the Educational Drinking Show, and so far it has been a rip-roaring good time. Building on this momentum, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be a very special week for this Thirsty Broadcast, and I'll tell you why. Before taking on my current post here as Director of Education at Anchor Distilling Company, I was a writer inspired by the work of the great Hunter S. Thompson and I launched a national print beverage publication, Mutiner Magazine, in collaboration with some of the finest and most talented folks you could ever imagine. I lived the life of a vagabond writer from 2007 until 2013 and I know firsthand that being a professional writer in this modern era of journalism is every bit as challenging as it is rewarding. And let's just say it is very rewarding. Which brings me to this week, when I have the opportunity to shine a spotlight on two writers that have long inspired me in very big ways. These are two very special guys, and I couldn't be more excited to share their stories with you this week. Let's do this. This episode of the Educational Drinking Show is sponsored by Junipero Gin, which is the original American craft gin going back to 1996 and the pioneering work of Fritz Maytag, which also makes it the gin of San Francisco. At 98.6 proof, it's a bit stronger than most gins and perfect in your favorite gin cocktail. Good stuff. My guest today is Camper English, best known for his work on his blog, Alcademics.com. In this humble host's opinion, Mr. English is one of the most inspired, talented, and influential spirits and cocktail writers today, and has been a leading pioneer of spirits and cocktail writing in the digital era. He was recognized in the 2011 Tales of the Cocktail Spirited Awards for Best Cocktail Writing and has returned as a finalist since. And he relentlessly puts out original writing that doesn't just comment on the modern cocktail and spirits experience, it adds something to the conversation, and that is not something to be underestimated. Based right here in San Francisco, USA, it is my great pleasure to share with you my conversation with Camper English. Uh, well, I was writing about... Uh, nightlife uh, for it was the first writing that I did and that was career number three um, in the uh, late 90s early 2000s and uh, I was writing bar and club reviews when I was unemployed uh, and uh, when I was unemployed as a software engineer I was started writing bar and club reviews for a little bit of money what and year is that that's um, I started around 1999 or so would be my first published thing I would say and then uh, I was unemployed in 2001 along with a whole lot of people who are in the tech industry at the time and I uh, was supplementing my unemployment by doing bar and club reviews yeah and then I realized it wasn't until really 2006 that it's not about bars and clubs and reviewing after hours parties for me it's more about uh the the drinks themselves and uh better ingredients and the spirits as well as the uh, mixer side and all of that so it um i could sort of see the cocktail renaissance about to bloom in san francisco and globally so i refocused to worry less about what's the best party uh, and who's the best dj and more about uh the actual drinks themselves. So you were really into the bar and nightclub scene, and that's kind of what drew you to doing those reviews in the first place? Oh, yeah. I'm like long-time club trash. I, uh, <laughs> I grew up watching, like, New York City disco movies on TV, and uh, it was like, that's what I want out of life. And I had that for a while. I was a raver. I had hair at once uh, one time, and it was blue at one time, and uh, fuzzy pants, the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's while I was uh, in, in previous careers and then uh so i started doing that because it's something i knew a lot about um nightlife and then that changed over so i was writing about night nightlife before i was writing about anything else mm -hmm. uh, and then 
I uh, had to improve the writing a little bit as I became a writer professionally. Yeah. Okay. So you write about bars and nightclubs for seven years, 2006 hits, and you have this realization that there's something brewing in terms of culturally cocktails and bars and there's an opportunity for you. What'd you do next? Well, I started focusing on the how spirits are made and the mechanics of how cocktails were made. A lot of this sort of came to me from some of the brands who reached out to me after having done some work for the San Francisco Chronicle. I uh, wrote a big story when Bourbon and Branch first opened. That was a really big opening at the end of 2006 and uh, was invited on some trips and visited some distilleries and finally had the opportunity to see how stuff was made mm -hmm. and I instantly became you know that guy with all the questions at the distillery you know but how many microns is that filter exactly um, okay it all spiraled out of control from there and when did uh, when did academics come into the picture well I had I've been blogging since uh, before the word blog was uh, created and uh, I had like a daily sort of nightlife web blog and uh, then when I started writing about drinks full time, I spun that off. Uh, it was one blog of several on my website, which was cramper.com a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then I realized I needed a dedicated website um, as writing about booze was becoming my professional life rather than my personal life. And so then Alcademics uh, came about, I think, around 2007. What happened to Cramper? Uh, Cramper now forwards you to <laughs> academics. It used to have like so much embarrassing stuff on it. Nobody like look that up in the internet archives, please. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you choose the name academics? Oh, I like smashing words together. So yeah. it makes sense. Uh, being that's the, uh, sort of more academic study of, of alcohol. And beyond just wanting to maybe focus your writing, um, did you have a vision for academics when you started focusing on it more? Well, really, I was treating it as like, uh, follow along with me while I learn all this stuff. And and eventually I got to this level of expertise where it's now it's like, follow along with me as I teach you this stuff. And so I, a lot of it was learning and still continually learning the, the whole time. But now it's a lot of my sort of career has shifted into uh, talks and cocktail contest judging and things like that. So there's, uh, it's definitely more of an authoritative voice than it used to be. It was like, I don't know what the heck I'm doing, but it sure tastes yum. When, when did you realize that academics was potentially relevant to the culture and industry? Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> um, is it? Um, I mean, I had a big discovery on ICE a, a while back, and that uh, spread the word a lot further. Tell me about further. that. Uh, I was studying how to make clear ice because I went to some seminars about uh, ice programs in New York bars, and the science behind it that the people were talking about seemed rather uh, flimsy, and I decided to test all the theories I had read about and see what really worked in sort of a scientific methodology uh, and I spent about nine months before I figured out a super easy way to make clear ice and uh, then I've I've been talking about ice ever since so it was pretty it got a lot of attention and, and people really related to it it did and it's still a lot of people haven't seen it so there are a lot of people continually discovering oh I don't have to boil the water and uh, <laughs> to make clear ice but I've always heard that we know everyone's always heard that and it's doesn't really help that much so you've almost been doing this for 10 years in terms of academics yeah full-time only studying uh, uh, liquor and cocktails a uh, little bit of bars and bartending stuff like that just my full attention's been to it for uh, 10 years. Man. And I remember we, uh, maybe 2010, 2011, went to London and Barcelona. We did. With the uh, fine folks from Bacardi and got to do a little bit of adventuring, which was pretty fun. Yep. <laughs> it's kind of a blur. It, it is. I remember we had a great garnish presentation. At Artesian. Yep. That was nutty. That was cool. That was great. All I'm, of their... I think I became like a... Normally, I think I would be more of a classicist, like, oh, it's all about flavor and garnish doesn't matter. But, you know, heck, I like garnish a lot. <laughs> like, make it big, make it fun. Why the heck not? Uh, I feel it's 
not something I'm supposed to like, but I really do. And as we kind of go towards this, I feel like cocktails in general are going a little bit more minimal in terms of concept, but garnishes are a way to express creativity within the minimalism of, say, a classic cocktail or a very traditional cocktail. And there's so much room for creativity and innovation within the world of garnishes. It's so exciting. Yeah, I, and you know, and also drinkers really like it. It's right. Uh, you know, it's Instagrammable. It's uh, uh, it looks cool. It gets people excited about the drinks. Uh -huh. um, it gets people out of the mindset of oh, this is a very serious cocktail bar. I must have a very serious time here on my Tinder date. <laughs> and um, uh, it gets people into the fun mode uh, again. I also get the sense that research is a really important part of your process and really distinguishes your work. I feel like you, you just put a lot of thought into uh, the stuff that you put out into the world. Yeah, you know, there, there are writers who specialize in uh, historical research, and that's not really me, although I'm doing a lot of that now. But um, uh, And I focused more on sort of scientific research. Well, let's test. How long does simple syrup last and does having a two-to-one simple syrup lasts longer than a one-to-one -one simple syrup. And so we'll, we'll make each of them and compare and uh, do a time test, things like that. And that's uh, become, I guess, my specialty in the, in the field a bit. What are some of the other kind of scientific method experiments you have run? Well, besides ice, which was the biggest and longest one, which is still continues today, a lot of actually my readers now do the research independently and report back, and I can just publish their results. Really? Uh, I published a blog post today that a reader uh, contributed. Well, he pretty much did the whole thing, and I just put his pictures in my blog post and was like, hey, here's a cool way that someone figured out using a little slightly different technique to achieve the same results, which was uh, clear ice balls. Really? That's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. Like, I... I mean, I'm not the only ice nerd out there in the world. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands now, and they uh, uh, eventually find their way back to academics and can follow along and help improve stuff that I've done. And I may not always have time for that because, like, no one wants to read about ice all the time except me. And <laughs> uh, uh, when people find improvements, you know, I... I, unlike some other people, give credit for that and so, uh, appreciate the people who have invented these techniques. And then I want to say, was it 2011, Tales of the Cocktail? You won Best Cocktail Writing? Uh, yeah, I won it once. Uh, I've been on the uh, nominated for it a bunch of times. So, yeah, around there. Tell me about that, that experience of, of getting that kind of recognition from the industry. Uh, it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my strong my strong point in, uh, in the uh, as a, a writer and journalist isn't actually the the writing. You know, I'm not a, a beautiful language creator. Mm -hmm. I can mash words together and I can explain explain things uh, fairly well. But uh, I'm not. You know, I don't create beautiful sentences that will be remembered and quoted for centuries or anything like that. So uh, I think. Uh, and the way the voting works at Tales of the Cocktail a little bit, it's about recognition for hard work or maybe importance and influence. And uh, that's a, a, a very nice honor to be recognized for that. If, if it was a writing contest with all the writers <laughs> who write about drinks now in the world, it would I would not be in the top four at any time, let alone a winner. Was that pretty validating for you in terms of your journey as a writer and blogger? I, I have a... I guess a greater sense of satisfaction uh, for what I've done mostly on my own website than in the outside world of mm -hmm. journalism because that involves editors and pitching and you have to pay your rent and all of that, mm -hmm. whereas I'm the master of academics and uh, can do whatever I want on there. And in terms of that, it's really interesting because on the one hand, you're kind of riding this wave of, of a renaissance or even a revolution of, of cocktail culture, but on the other side, there's also this revolution of media, and you're kind of at this intersection of, of both of those. So everything that you're doing is really kind of pioneering in a sense because it hasn't been done before at this level. Well, everything's changing for sure. Uh, in the both the cocktail world is constantly changing these days, uh, as well as media is changing at a far faster rate. And uh, now, whereas before, yeah, I would 
have to write a hundred club reviews to pay the rent. <laughs> now I can uh, write a little bit less. It still pays terribly, but then I might get invited to judge cocktail conferences or give talks and things like that. So the writing provides the window to other opportunities. What's your favorite uh, beverage producing region you've ever visited? Oh boy. Um, don't mess this up. This is a big question. <laughs> it is a big question. I don't know. I mean, uh, Martinique's rum distilleries, rum agricole distilleries are amazing because yeah. they have great big, it's like big trucks of the <laughs> distilling world. <laughs> and so it's great big gears uh, processing the sugar cane <laughs> and things like that. So that was certainly uh, created an impression. Although uh, about a year ago, I visited the Armagnac region and that was uh, really special as well throughout the distilling season people are invited to just come hang out at the still because it it happens continually over weeks to months depending on the distillery and they just have events where hey come in sit by the still uh, enjoy some drinks and dinner while we watch <laughs> the still <laughs> slowly drip off uh, armagnac into the barrel one barrel at a time so that was uh, pretty special as well and word on the street is you had a pretty cool trip to uh, Sweden with the Carlson's folks at one point. I did. I did get to go, and we got to play in the potato fields and <laughs> pull out virgin potatoes from the soil, and uh, that was a, a great trip. Uh, also spent uh, some time in Stockholm bars. Uh, mm. That was crazy. A uh, good time. What about bar scenes around the world? What has really resonated with you as places that are special for their cocktail scene? Well, some of them would be the expected ones, like London, uh, like San Francisco, of course. That's I was in a, the right place at the right time uh, for to write about cocktails on the West Coast. I mean, initially when I started writing about cocktails, the big food magazines wouldn't deign to acknowledge them more than once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. And now every single month there is a cocktail columnist for all of the big food magazines. But uh, so it's really hard to get stuff published back then. And uh, uh, as that uh, in San Francisco was one of the leading cities of the cocktail renaissance. So we had people like Scott Beatty and Doug and McDonald and uh, uh, the folks at Absinthe doing really cool, innovative stuff in San Francisco. But it was really hard to bring any attention to it at all. Mm -hmm. Now we can look sort of globally and uh, continue to see cities changing. San Francisco, I think, is changing in a, a, at a slower rate now, but you go to places, uh, I haven't been there in a while now, to, to Singapore, for example, it's just on fire. There's yeah, like you keep hearing about it. Constantly, yeah. yeah. And it's uh, actually a lot of uh, cool people who used to live in uh, California. Consulting. <laughs> yep, are consulting yeah. there. It used to be full of uh, British people consulting, but it's sort of shifted a little bit uh, in the American way, as well as... Uh, uh, Copenhagen is one of my favorite drinking cities mm. in the world. Every time I go there, I have way too much fun. Um, <laughs> and uh, gosh, uh, you know, I I like every drinking city, but uh, those are some of my favorites. When you walk into a bar, what are some of the factors or qualities of that bar experience that really resonate with you as terms of a quality bar? Well, my particular tastes in a uh, good drinking experience are... Um, some people are all about let's have the most fun bar that makes good basic drinks and I would rather have a very very fussy bar that does everything exactly right and that's just my personal preference mm -hmm. I like to sit at the bar and talk to the bartender and be able to that's why I tend to go out on Mondays rather than Fridays and uh, so I'm of course looking at the back bar I'm looking at the cocktail list I personally like innovation in cocktails and I I like them to show it as well. A lot of the molecular mixology bars, especially the early ones, sort of, oh, we just do that in the back and you don't see it, but it, we do it and make our lime juice clear or whatever, but we don't show that. And I'm like, no, I want to see it. Show me the work. Show me the centrifuge. Like, bring it on. I want the science. <laughs> so <laughs> those are things that I enjoy in a, in a bar. I'm not saying it's a measure of a good bar for everybody to have, you know, test tubes and... Uh, things on fire and spinning around and being distilled on site, but it's something that I like. Yeah. And as I understand it, you have a, a tail seminar coming up that is uh, addressing some of these more innovative house made potentially ingredients and such. Can you tell me about that? Sure. Yeah. I'm doing a seminar called uh, the roof is on fire, dangerous drinks. <laughs> 
<laughs> and <laughs> it's about uh, some ingredients that maybe we should take a, a step back or look at more carefully before we go willy-nilly playing with them. Uh, for example, homemade tonic water syrup that a lot of people are using. Uh, if you read books from the 1950s and earlier in the U.S., you'll find a lot of warnings about tonic water. Like, you don't want to have more than three of these because you're ha you'll get a terrible headache the next day. Well, that's synchonitis. It's, uh, it's caused by the tonic water. And uh, it wouldn't happen now. I think I calculated you'd have to drink 110 liters of legal U.S. Uh, tonic water in order to uh, give yourself even the recommended anti-malarial dose of... Uh, it's a lot of tonic water. That's a lot of tonic water. It's more than even I can drink. And uh, <laughs> But so people making tonic syrups might be... They're using uh, natural products from trees and it's bark and we don't really know how much of the quinine is getting into the final mm. drink. And for people who are drinking a lot of that, it can build up in your system and uh, cause issues. And that's that's just one thing that we were talking about uh, along with a lot of others like tobacco bitters, which are bad and actually not legal. <laughs> and uh, things like meat infusions where, you know, if you leave them around too long, that can be a really dangerous idea. Things like that. So I have a lot of research to do for it still. I sort of have a a hit list for ingredients that we think might be bad or that we know are illegal um, in the United States. And then I want to look closer at those uh, and be able to explain either what a safe level is or a safer preparation of that is. And, you know, it, there's a big difference between doing something at home and poisoning yourself and serving <laughs> something at a bar and poisoning <laughs> 50 people. So uh, I think it's, it's, just a factor that needs to be discussed. So mm -hmm. I'm uh, excited to, well, one, do the research, and then two, give the talk. That's got to be an interesting uh, experimentation process at home, testing out all the dangerous ingredients. <laughs> well, I don't plan to do a whole lot of, like, like how much will this take to poison me? But <laughs> <laughs> I do plan to do a lot of research as far as uh, food safety and preparation yeah. laws, <laughs> things like that. And you've done quite a few seminars at Tales of the Cocktail, yeah? Yeah, yeah, pretty much almost every year since 2008, I think. Wow. Every, Any of them stand one. out to you? Oh, yeah, I've done some super nerdy ones there. I did one on water and the importance of water in spirits, uh, and that was that was one of my favorite talks I've ever given. And uh, What was the conclusion? Well, water matters in the production of spirits, but not in the way that people think it does, <laughs> and uh, that's... That's the short takeaway from a very uh, long seminar. <laughs> uh, we also talked a bit about ice and about yeah. um, carbonation and things like that in it. But we did a cool tasting where you take little bits of um, mineral powders and put them in water and then take the same scotch whiskey and pour equal parts scotch and, oh, wow. and water with only one mineral added to each. And the whiskey tastes dramatically different. Uh, with each of those uh, different mineral waters. So that's post-distillation, but that matters a lot, it, it turns out, as well, which is something I went into the whole experiment thinking uh, that's it's not important at all. Like, everybody goes and shows you their well, but when they reduce uh, spirit to proof, they're using 60% uh, just river osmosis filtered tap water. Uh, mm -hmm. And all of that special water that you got shown the stream or the cave or the reservoir and all of that, that's like 13% of the bottle. So is it important at all? Well, yeah, it's super important, but not <laughs> in the way that we think. Wow. And you did a really cool study on sugar too, right? Uh, I, yeah, I studied sugar a lot um, for a seminar on sugar. And some of that was history and some of it was use and uh, some of it was used in cocktails and things like that. Cool. Um, what in the world of cocktails and, and beverages in general has your attention right now? What fascinates you? What inspires you? Well, right now I'm like deep into the study of really the history of, I, I can say it's the history of the gin and tonic, but it's more the history of tonic, which is the history of quinine, which is the history of seeking a cure for malaria. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, uh, I'm probably eight books in it and I've got a huge stack at home 
because you can look uh, through the viewpoint of that in many different points in history, the U.S. Civil War, you can look through it at, in colonialism, you can look through it in uh, uh, sugarcane production in the Caribbean uh, as the colony spread to the New World. And uh, I just learned a really cool thing about uh, quinine is that when they figured out they figured out early that you could cure malaria with quinine uh -huh. with uh, cinchona bark uh even before they figured out the science of of what caused it uh they also knew that um uh syphilis was a terrible disease and they could find that it was that it was some sort of bug and they knew that you could destroy that by uh heating up blood but there's no good practical way to just heat up somebody's blood, <laughs> at least not at the time. <laughs> so they would give people with late stage syphilis uh, malaria and then they would <laughs> have these horrible, painful fevers, but they knew how to cure them. Um, so they would give people syphilis, Whoa. malaria, and then give a couple rounds of the fevers and then cure them of the malaria. And that in, say, 50 percent or so of the cases of uh, syphilis would cure the syphilis as well. Oh, I, wow. I just learned that last week. I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> so let's say you decide one day that you want to dive in deep to the history of the gin and tonic. What's your approach to researching something like that, you know, at a high level? Well, usually I'll just start with a scrap of something and then get interested about one aspect. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then research that more. For example, the a person who was trying to synthesize uh, a synthetic uh, quinine accidentally invented a really cool color, uh, the color mauve, and uh, then uh, just gave up science and went into dye making and actually created a global fashion trend of the 1890s for the color mauve because it was a really hard color to make and a, uh, a color fast dye at the time. So it's things like that. You, you find an interesting point and then... G run with it and you can find really cool stuff that way and what what is the ultimate goal with this research project well i'm hoping to do some sort of book or books uh self-published or not but uh right now i can't stop reading about it i'm really obsessed with every little facet of it because it, it it's pretty much the history of of civilization for the last uh three or four hundred years um, looking into that deeper, like malaria has affected every part of the world except for maybe Antarctica mm -hmm. um, and uh, how regions grew and how colonialism grew and all of that. So it's there's a lot to, <laughs> to look into there. And eventually I hope to uh, put the books down and, you know, start typing. You got to write a book. Yeah, there's a, there's a few I should probably get in there. It seems like the next logical step at this point. Yeah, I, it's, uh, writing a book is a long process, and publishing is, is awful, so I, I <laughs> will see what I do about that uh, process, but uh, it may end up self-publishing or something like yeah. that. I mean, I, I think that uh, enough people are interested in what I have to say naturally that I can maybe self-publish something and not have to, to deal with the, the hard route of, a proposal and market analysis and all mm -hmm. of that in order to get a book published two years later. <laughs> Whereas I could just write it and print it and then sell it. And that's uh, what I'm thinking now. But yeah, it's, uh, it's hard for me to take the single minded attention that it takes to sit down and write a book. And I think I need to go away to like a deserted island or something and, <laughs> and start typing. Have there been any recent books that have come out by other authors that have caught your attention? Uh, yeah, really. I mean, the, the biggest one in the past few years would be Dave Arnold's book, Liquid Intelligence, because mm -hmm. that had a lot of uh, scientific equipment uh, solutions to cocktail issues. And so I got really into that. Um, and uh, I mean, I continue reading a lot of books, but that's been, I, I think that would have the largest impact for me um, in the past uh, several years. Uh, Amy Stewart's Drunken Botanist was an amazing book. So good. And it made me just want to research more about everything. That actually has a great chapter on tonic water and quinine as well. Mm -hmm. And I learned a couple of things from that that set me off on a, a long, dark journey that I'm currently still on. That's awesome. Uh, you know, another memory that comes to mind in hanging out with you is I went to a party at your house 
and the drinks were awful. They were absolutely <laughs> terrible. And I think it was because you were um, you were cleaning out some press samples That's of the true. stuff that couldn't hang, and boy, it couldn't hang. It could not hang, but I gave a lot of uh, gag Christmas gifts uh, <laughs> to the attendees of the party. I think the rule was that you could drink anything in my collection it's just my liquor cabinet but you had to take something from like the the bad pile of stuff <laughs> that I was trying wild. to get rid of so all of the uh, flavored moonshine products uh, ended up going as, as gag Christmas gifts and things like that but you know the this, birthday cake vodka yeah I I did one a set of experiments for a talk at Tales of Cocktail last year I was like well you know if I could just get the flavor out of this flavored vodka then I'd at least have something to use to <laughs> disinfect the bathroom, but um, if not drink. But uh, it turns out you can run cake flavored vodka through a Brita a Brita hundred times, and the cake flavor stays in. And you you did this experiment. I did this experiment. Yes, and failed miserably. I did fail. Um, although I did find if you dehydrated cake flavored vodka, you could find out exactly how much sugar is in flavored vodka, and it's a lot in. The more confectionery flavors because it tastes like sugar well you know there's actually sugar there too and uh then that sugar actually tastes like cake frosting it's almost like they infuse vodka with cake frosting to come up with cake frosting flavored vodka <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do with all this knowledge oh i don't know i'll probably forget it or <laughs> <laughs> some of, so hopefully some of it i'll write down the good thing about having a website of my own yeah. is that it's it's there forever. You write it and you put it out and I might forget some of the stuff I've done or exactly how a spirit was made. And I'm constantly searching my own website to look at the time that I went to that distillery or did that uh, project or whatever. And, uh, to refer to it. Uh, whereas all the stuff that I write for a zillion different publications, it goes and it's out there and it may stay on their website, uh, for a while, but that's not really how sort of news and magazine organizations work that much. Whereas I consider my own, even though it's a blog, to be a repository of information that's useful. As long as you don't go back too far, I think probably anything before 2009 might not be like me at my finest yet. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of stuff since then anyway. And what are some of your favorite places to drink here in San Francisco and or when you get those inevitable emails of people asking you where they should check out when they come to town? What are your, uh, some of your favorite places to recommend? Well, I, I have a, a secret list that I send to visiting bartenders, which are some places that I think they should visit and why they might want to. And those include everything um, from uh, uh, the place with punch on tap um, and uh, but I'm blanking on its name right now, uh, that does high volume club style craft cocktails for a lot of people, even though there's no DJ in this particular bar. Uh, two places that are uh, so fussy uh, and uncomfortable, but the cocktail programs are amazing. So that would include Bar Agricole, which is one of my favorite bars on the planet, which sources their brandy barrel by barrel individually. They're like, oh, we're out of Armagnac. I guess we'll have to fly to France. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's cool. Like, there's, I don't know of any other bar in the U.S. that, that does that. They buy their cognac, Armagnac, and uh, Calvados, uh, buy the barrel, have it proof to their specifications, usually a little bit higher than 40%, so that it's uh, good for cocktails have it bottled up and imported by an importer they work with for that because you can't just buy a barrel mm -hmm. and put it on a boat and uh, send to the bar. And then from that, every other ingredient in a single drink, it sounds simple and they may only list three ingredients, but it's like, well, we had to design the bitters for that drink and we asked this producer to make the syrup for us and all of that. So mm -hmm. it's a, a lot of work going into a very simple sounding drink and everything tastes like a big scoop of dirt in every cocktail so it's one of my favorite places to drink and it, it goes back to that attention to detail that you were talking about that's so important to you before yeah exactly uh, it's they i don't think are thinking too much about what's going to sell the most here mm -hmm. i think they're thinking like what is how do we make this the best and then maybe we'll compromise from like how much money we could spend per drink to like a practical solution of a drink that's great with 
that reflects our values and is a good drink for a lot of people. So that's that's why I like that place in particular. Although I, I there are gosh so many good bars in San Francisco. I think uh, Comstock Saloon comes in at one of my favorites uh, just because they have the most boring cocktail menu in town. But you know when you don't order from the cocktail menu, it's well known. You just have a bartender's choice for every drink, and they do such a great job with that that not every bar does who promotes a bartender's choice selections that. I'm just always happy every time I go into Comstock Saloon. Always have a good experience there. Do you have any thoughts on the overall kind of state of the bar scene here in San Francisco and where it's headed? I think where we're headed is a little bit uh, entrepreneurial as far as the bartenders who sort of hanging out in San Francisco for a long time are now sort of opening their own bars and becoming a little bit more conservative with what they'll serve because now it's there profit center. So we're seeing uh, a lot of bartender owned bars, which is great, but also uh, drinks that aren't don't stray super far uh, from a brown bittered and stirred uh, beverage uh, in a lot of places. And um, so that's a little bit, I guess I would say disappointing to me. But on the other hand, a lot of the people coming up in the industry who are now at the bartender level, it's not their bar. They love being creative and getting crazy with garnish and everything else like that. It's uh, ex- exciting to see what those folks are doing. And in, in talking about those kinds of bartenders, what are some of the, the spirits, the categories that are really on trend in terms of being creative? Well, right now, I think people are finally playing with brandy a lot more than they were in the past, uh, all sorts of brandies. and. Part of that is because the prices are coming down a little bit. People are making brandies for mixology, and uh, that's a great thing on, on all sides. <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to see that, as well as custom ingredients, I guess, have been a, a thing for a while. But now people are being smarter about it. Uh, I believe it was Johnny Raglan who told me at Comstock when he was there that it's like, I'm not going to make a tonic syrup because I know I can't do better than Fever Tree Tonic. Like, it's it's great product, and mine is going to be brown if I try to make it, so why do that? So the smart choices that bartenders are making are really interesting. I'm now deeply into the why <laughs> question. Mm-hmm. Why did you make it with this? Why choose that ingredient? Um, why is it here on the menu as opposed to there? And things like that. Interesting. Yeah, brandy. Brandy is an interesting category. We used to work with a brandy de Jerez, and like it was amazing. And just people don't really know about it. And there's so many kind of expressions of brandy within the brandy category. Yeah, it's a really scary category to consumers uh, still. I think. Yeah, yeah. So much opportunity. I don't think it brings to mind anything uh, immediately. Brandy. Okay. Well, <laughs> I really like a cognac or whatever, and. Uh, they, it's just too it's too much <laughs> the category is sort of too big and not familiar enough but uh you can make some great cocktails with all sorts of brandy okay random question here um as i grab myself a little bit more delicious english harbor rum which we are drinking out of our uh you know, it's not a late night show without a, a late night mug, even though it's the middle of the day. I, I thought we were supposed to pretend it's coffee. It's absolutely oh, coffee. Oh, that's, yes, because we're staying up so late. I know, right? <laughs> it's, ooh, 10 after 5. Precisely. <laughs> um, you got to tell me about these these glasses that y- you got. I know you busted them out special for all, all the fans out there. I knew I wouldn't be recognized without without the glasses. What, what's, the, what's the whole story behind the glasses and all the selfies with all the fans at uh, Tails and whatnot? <laughs> uh, it's mostly with friends more than fans, I would say. But uh, so I my last pair of glasses, I was on a plane to New York and some San Francisco hippies next to me took the opportunity when I was in the restroom to get up and use the restroom and spill my drink all over my laptop and knock my glasses off the chair back and step on them, breaking them in half. So I needed a new (laughs) pair of glasses relatively uh, shortly uh, thereafter. So I went to a uh, lens crafters and was like, I'm not going to find what I need out here. I'm going to find it in your bad drawer of the glasses that don't (laughs) sell. And they're like, well, all right, whatever. It's over there. And I put them on and looked up and 
everybody uh, started laughing at me from behind the counter, which I'm pretty sure they're not supposed to do at LensCrafter, but I was like, sold! And so <laughs> my big, giant, goofy glasses have been, uh, I guess, a key identifying factor ever since then. Uh, I don't plan to wear them forever, but, um, you know, I do need them to see, in case anyone's wondering. And, uh, uh, yeah, they're just... I think they're fun. They sort of reflect the personality of someone who's uh, a nerd but not serious. So you hate hippies, basically. That's what that's, that story's about. That's uh, pretty much the conclusion you should draw from that story. Good, good. Yeah. That, that origin story was way better than I anticipated, <laughs> actually. <laughs> well, any story with lens crafters in it is going to be good, to be <laughs> honest. It's a really low bar. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you headed next? What's next for you? Um, next, I'm probably giving a couple talks in Chicago, not really sure on what yet, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to Las Vegas, oh, I'm going to see the a 20,000 person stadium with a big cocktail ice program. I'm so excited to see what when that looks like. When are you doing like. that? Um, in April. Yeah? And uh, For WSWA? I'll be there for WSWA oh. and then uh, heading off to see some cool Vegas size cocktail programs. I'm going to see the liquor room of a casino where they pump vodka from like one room to 28 bars. Like, Whoa. Yeah, I'm so excited for it. And uh, and uh, that should be cool. And I'll have some stories to write about that. And uh, uh, I love the behind the scenes stuff. We should hang. I'm going to be there. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Nice. You gamble? Uh, I do not gamble. No, we. I don't. We, not because of principles, but um, because, uh, I, yeah, I just don't bother with that. Well, <laughs> we're gonna do something about that, and we're gonna have to go uh, check out some spots. We have to find slot machines that we actually get to pull the thing. Because for me, like, I'll pay a quarter just to pull a handle. All yeah, day. Like, I don't care if you never win anything. <laughs> it's like, oh, what comes out? You have the lights turn. It's awesome. Any bars that you're looking forward to in Vegas? Um, I'm looking to see, I don't know, I, I sort of have had my expectations built up uh, a few times uh, mm -hmm. in Vegas, and sometimes they've been fully realized and sometimes not so much. So uh, and uh, so I look forward to trying it out. And actually, I've never been to the old part of Vegas, the mm. old downtown, and I really want to go see that. Yeah, we should go just tear it up. Yeah. Tear it up. There's a lot to see. It's overwhelming, actually. Yeah, it is. I tend to like stick close now, uh, whereas when I used to go to Vegas, I'm like, let's go to every casino on the strip and ride the roller coaster and <laughs> take the floon ride or whatever it is to the canal and New York. Are you just going to the everywhere. amusement parks? Uh, yeah, I was just walking through everything and then a little hit of action at each place, but now, now not so much. Do you enjoy giving talks and, and seminars and lectures and so forth? Oh, yeah. Forcing people to listen to me is my favorite thing. Yeah? Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I would have never guessed that. Uh, yeah. No, I love it. It's like, I have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> and you actually paid uh, to watch me say it. That's awesome. Like, I feel super cool uh, when I get to do that. And, you know, a lot of the time people do actually like it. So that makes me feel good when people are like, oh, refund. <laughs> it's not so uh, uh, good for the ego. But um, <laughs> in the cases <laughs> where people do learn stuff and come out of there excited, ideally excited to learn more stuff, then, then that makes me incredibly happy. Absolutely. Well, I guess the, um, the only thing I'll leave you with here as we kind of wrap things up, it's like I got a kind of a secret to pass along here. I like secrets. Y your your office mate is hot. <laughs> oh yeah, you think? I think. You, you married quality or? I mean, I don't know about that, but but <laughs> I might have a little crush on her. Yeah, I I think you might. Maybe maybe if she's listening to this. You, you got a nutty office over there. I do have a nutty office over there. Nutty office mate who you're married to, and. Um, <laughs> Uh, I texted her on the way over asking how much it would cost to mention her business name on air, but I don't think she's going to follow through with that dollar amount. No? Yeah. Her loss. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to share some stories with us. And uh, as I said, I think it's incredible what you've accomplished, what you've contributed, and uh, just your approach and your methodology. And you're so thoughtful about all the stuff that you create. And I know you got a lot more creativity and expression in you. So... I do hope you'll come back and share more stories with us sooner 
rather than later, and O Vegas is going to happen. <laughs> All right, let's, let's get messy. Game on. Till next time. All right, cheers.